Okay, also this week, I'm going to have you dive into the mirror wife. But before we dive into the mirror wife, um, I want to go over my notes and some of the things that stood out to me about the lines in Beowulf, because I noticed that in your work, um, many of you kind of dipped in, but kind of stayed in summary mode or didn't get as deep into the line, line by line um, kind of analysis. Um, and I think that it's because these older texts can be very intimidating. Um, it makes, they, they resist you feeling like you can understand it, like it's something that's so foreign to you. Um, so I just wanna go over some of my notes in the hopes that you'll hear me kind of talk through some of my thoughts and maybe I can give you some general tips or ideas on how to tackle this kind of a text in the future because obviously this isn't the last of it. Um, luckily for you all, The Mere Wife is uh, a text written uh, in our modern English and it's set in our time. Um, in a lot of ways, Maria Devani Headley in The Mere Wife is analyzing Beowulf. And for her, she does it through the lens of the female characters um, in Beowulf. So in order to truly kind of get all of the, the details and the inside jokes and the things she's pointing out in The Mere Wife, um, you, you want to go back and just make sure you have a good grasp of Beowulf. And if you relied on help, um, sites like Schmoop or any other kind of site that helped to gain, give you some insight and summary, that's okay. I am for using your resources. But I don't want you to use your resources as an alternative to reading the text yourself or in privileging their interpretations and readings of the text. They tend to stay in the general um, intentionally because they are targeted typically towards high school students. Um, and so what I'd like you all to do is kind of take the risk. You might be wrong, but dive into the lines. Um, see what you see. Um, I like to say to just kind of let go all thoughts of what you think the text is going to be like. Read it, let it wash over you. Ignore the parts you don't understand. And when something does make sense to you, highlight it. Then maybe go back later and reread the previous part and it'll suddenly start becoming clear to you what's going on. So let's just dive in. So first of all, this was a translation by uh, Seamus Haney. It's one of the most famous, well-known, most read versions of Beowulf. Um, and as you read in Maria Devani Headley's introduction to her newest translation of Beowulf, she talks about the idea of translation and, and the many, many, many kinds of translations and the effects that this should have or the things you should be thinking while you're reading. Like, basically take it with a grain of salt, right? This is a translation. Um, and while there are a lot of places where the translators saw the same thing, there are places where it's highly disputed and that really critically changed the meaning of the text. Also remember that this is, uh, so all those pieces that were taken out that are summarized, um, that's not what the original uh, Seamus Haney translation, he, the, the full text, um, that Seamus Haney translated, Haney translated, does not have those summarized pieces. Um, th that was added here uh, so that this can be a free version, right? So that they, um, because uh, Seamus Haney's version is copyrighted, his translation is copyrighted. Um, same with uh, Devonna Headley's. So we dive in. Um, you want to notice uh, in a text like this, or when I give you text, if they give you headings, they give you translations within the text, use those to guide you. So it says introduction of the Danes. So kind of the two main groups that we are looking at in Beowulf are the Danes and um, the Swedes, no, the Danes and the uh, Geats. Gosh, sorry. Okay. Um, so we open here with um, 
introduction of kind of the history of, of uh, um, this family and Harrod Hall. So we learn in this line, sheep, shield sheepskin, a scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. What's interesting about this, now that you've read the whole tale, isn't that how Bale, or Grendel is described? Scourge of many tribes, wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. But here, this is our first introduction to this king, Shield Sheepson. This terror of the hall troops had come far. So I just noticed, I, I just highlighted that because that's just such a strange thing, right? Here we thought to be a hero when we think about it in our modern context, the things that heroes have come to mean, to be a hero, to be a king, all these positive attributes. But here, there is something different happening and we need to ask ourselves why and mark it here to see if this um, duplicity um, or complication of terms continues throughout the text. So Shield Chiefson apparently was the scourge of tribes, he was a wrecker of meat benches, um, he was a terror of all troops, but he had come far, he had changed, he had evolved. Um, a foundling to start with, he would flourish later on. So again, this contrast between who he was in his past and who he is now. He became better, he became civilized, maybe? I don't know, because again, we are talking about battles of power that, that may be reflected in this tale, right? This may be about the oral tradition of the history of the battles between tribes and people. As his powers waxed and his worth was proved. So there's also this reoccurring theme, and then we see it paralleled later on with Beowulf. Beowulf is that as these kings age, their powers, become, they become less strong, um, but they've proven their worth. Now their stories start to overtake um, their actions. And in the end of this passage, that was one good king. So simply, despite how he started, a scourge of tribes, wrecker of mead benches, he was one good king in the end. Um, and here we also see our first uh, illusion or image of the ocean. Beyond the whale road had to yield to him. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the whale road had to yield to him. So all the people on different coasts on the other side of the oceans had to yield to him. He was one good king. So there is this constant imagery of traveling across oceans, sending um, uh, kings out to sea, right, in this, when this king dies. So you, the mirror being under the ocean, sea monsters, there's all, that, that's a huge, it's almost it's a character in and of itself. So then we go on in the lineage, a boy child was born to shield, um, uh, and this was his famous son named Bayo. So Bayo um, had behavior that's admired. So so Bayo is born, this is not Beowulf, um, was known through the north and a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives so that afterwards in age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. So again, there is this side-by-side -side comparison of time. So we had um, the king had this son. While the king and the son were alive together, he had one role in order to prepare for when his father passed and then he has to take on the fight. And we see that theme and story throughout this story. I highlighted this passage, behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. So this is such an interesting passage, behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. What do you, why do you think that's placed here? And do you see that occur later on or throughout the text? This idea of behavior being admired and then that is how you get power is by people kind of looking at you and thinking, wow, you're amazing. And then um, we move on to this section here where Shield dies. 
and we see this very elaborate, detailed image about sheep being put onto this boat um, and being sent out to sea covered in jewels and diamonds and swords and um, this kind of visual uh, tribute sent out to sea. It says it would travel it would travel far out on out into the ocean sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings. Um, no man can tell, no wise man in a hall or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. So it's not even just they send him out to sea, but there is this recognition that somebody's going to take that treasure that's there. So this is not just like this symbolic and then we forget about it that human peace is always also intertwined. And we see this again with the dragon and the slave, right? That there are these, there's, there are these treasures, these hordes um, left by ancient people. And then that treasure is found and taken. And then obviously they, those are catalysts um, to a lot of times wars and fighting. Then it falls to Bayo to keep the fort so father dies. Now it's his job to fight, to protect um, the forts. He was well regarded, ruled the Danes. People liked him. For a long time after his father took leave of his life on earth, so for many, many, many years, and then he had an heir, the great half Dane, and he held sway for as long as he lived their elder and warlord. So interestingly, this idea of warlord, because war and battle is a theme throughout. And while at first it seems paired with heroism, by the end, I think there's a more complicated view of war that's being explored by the poet. And then we go on to say um, uh, that Bayo begat Hirogar, Rothgar, the good Helga, um, and a daughter I have heard who was Anella's queen, a bomb in the bed to a battle-scarred Swede. The fortunes of war favored Rothgar. So now we're talking about Rothgar. So his mind turned to hall building. So Rothgar is important, right? Because now this is where we see Herod Hall, and this is where all the stuff goes down with Grendel. Um, so Rothgar builds this hall. His mind turned to hall building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or the people's <laughs> lives. Um, I, you know, that line stood out to me, but not the common land or people's lives. Um, I'm curious about it. It's a strange aside, I would say. And there's a lot of those throughout the text. Now, is that a, an issue of translation? Um, remember, or, or not remember, but this manuscript, Beowulf, along with Judith, um, was found um, together, and it has been through a lot. So when we read uh, Judith this week, you'll see that there's pieces missing, and here in that slave section, there's lines. That doesn't mean that there were not words there. It means that there's information missing, because it had been through a, the manuscripts had been through a fire, so these are the things that survived. And also note that um, these, this was a story, so stories were told through oral tradition, passed down from tribe to tribe. Um, and then this was written down in 800 by scribes. And um, I would argue that those scribes, those scribes were now Christian scribes. And this tale of the fights between, um, th this tale of the fights between the Danes and the Geats and the Swedes and like all this intersecting cultural mashup um, is, is paralleling what's happening. So at the time, Anglos and Saxons and all these tribes are invading what we now know to be England. Um, and through the battles and the marriages and the, you know, toppled kingdoms, 
uh, as people gain power, this is how different people come to be. So Anglo-Saxons are now emerging as this um, power that is also unified um, as Christians. So Christian scribes at the time, but there were still people who were not Christian. They were still tribes um, practicing, you know, different kinds of religions, pagan religions, uh, polytheistic religions. And we might, some scholars believe that this, all the allusions to what we know as Christian allusions were put in when the scribe wrote this down, but they were not necessarily, or we don't know if they were actually part of the original oral tales. But the oral tales were probably more reflective of the religions of the people who were passing them around orally. So you wanna keep that in mind when you're making um, those connections to religious illusions. They are there, of course, but then you also, when you look a little deeper and you look at some of the line comparisons, you're like, wait a minute, now they're talking about a different kind of God here. Um, and they forgot, like there's some, is it inconsistent? Is it purposeful? Is it a problem of translation? These are things to consider. Um, so we know uh, the Hall of Halls, Herod was the name. Um, and then uh, you start to see this is, uh, I don't know if this is the first time, but there's a lot of foreshadowing throughout the text and not only foreshadowing, but some of those foreshadows also act as parallels um, where you see the story where they're trying to set up this kind of formulaic tale of humanity that you see come back again and again. Um, but then there's also just the foreshadowing. There's a lot that this narrator is, is telling us like, and then this is something that's gonna happen. They don't know it yet, but this is gonna happen. So you also wanna think about who is this narrator? Who is telling the story to us? Um, cause that's also kind of interesting. They have a really distinct voice in line 38. I think they refer to themselves as I, so it's not a hidden narrator. So that's also an, an interesting curiosity. Are they talking about, are they looking back and speaking about the past? We'll see. Um, so the killer, that doom abided in the time, in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. So I also highlighted this because um, let's go back a little. The hall towered. It's gables wide and high and awaiting a barbarous burning. So Herod is built, but it's waiting to be burnt, right? It's waiting for the barbarian that's going to come and the future of it is, is here foretold as it's, you know, built in its glory. That doom abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws the bloodlust rampant. What's interesting here is they don't, the poet, the writer, doesn't explicitly talk about Rendell. It's more general than, the, than that which makes me think, and I think uh, Devonna Headley in her introduction um, mentions this as well, the idea that Grendel and monsters are more um, figurative than literal, right? This isn't really a story about a hero uh, fighting down monsters in this like sci-fi version, that this is instead um, more of a metaphorical tale. So here we see that this great hall was built, but eventually in this great hall, in these great halls, in these civilized spaces, in these conquered spaces, the killer instinct will still be unleashed among in-laws, among family members, among blood, among kin, the bloodlust rampant. So who are the monsters? Right? Are the monsters really monsters or the monsters within us? This is what happens through civilization, through money, through power. I don't know, but it's an interesting line. So then we have this break, uh, and this version tells us this is, we're push, we're uh, skipping to Grax Herit. Um, so we have our description of Grendel, powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nurse to hard grievance. There's some pretty um, uh, now typical uh, pairings of, of course, the monster associated with darkness and Herod Hall and heroes associated with lightness um, that we see, obviously, tropes carried from 800 to today. 
it harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet. So here's Grendel. He's like out in the darkness, outside of the hall versus, you know, inside with everybody. He's an outcast, we know later, because he's a, a descendant of Cain, who was outcast because he murdered Abel, you know. So, so also that kind of allusion to the past. And interestingly enough, because he's a monster, but he has a link to a human past. Um, but we'll talk about that later. So, uh, here, Grendel is angry about the partying that's happening, but the way that it's described here, it harrowed him to hear the din of the loud blank banquet every day in the hall, the heart being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet. So interestingly, that interestingly here, the text really points to this moment. So yes, he's angry about the loud banquet every day in the hall, but specifically the harp sounding and the stories beginning. And that the story that's being told is man's beginnings, how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. There's that water. So water is such a key throughout this tale. In his splendor, he set the sun and the moon to be the earth's lamplight, lanterns for men. So humans versus not insiders versus outsiders, that this lamp light, the sun and the moon were set for men and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life and every other thing that moved. Typically the retelling of um, creation that angers um, Grendel. And we don't know why. Um, but it, it is interesting to think about, like, is he angry because they're not telling it right? Have they retold history? Is it revisionist according to Grendel? We don't know, but these are interesting things to think about. Um, so then we move forward. Times are good. Things are good. Um, we are introduced to the demon's name, Grendel, here in this section. Uh, and then I highlighted this, he had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters. So Grendel is amongst other banished people. There are these monsters that have been banished. Um, Cain's clan, whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts for the killing of Abel. And so there's that biblical allusion to this group of people who are outcast because Cain killed Abel and Grendel and his people are descendants of Cain. So if you do a little research into that historical text, um, the Bible. So for those of you who might be religious, when we're, when we're talking about the Bible within this class, we are talking about it as a piece of literature as well. So if you can, you want to try to extricate any kind of religious meaning and try to think of it as if it's like an old text, just like Beowulf. So in that sense, if you think about it, and you think about the story of Cain and Abel, Abel was a shepherd, Cain was uh, a farmer. Uh, both were brothers toiling, creating their goods, and they um, both provide a sacrifice uh, to their God. And uh, Cain, as a farmer, provides a sacrifice, uh, or, you know, or, off, or an offering of his farmed goods, um, whatever that might be, but farmed goods, agricultural items, um, versus Abel, who's a shepherd and sacrifices a sheep or a lamb. Um, and that sheep lamb that is significant in, uh, if that's a common image, symbol throughout the text of the Bible. In either sense, you might want to think about that also, that association. Cain is associated with nature, farming, um, that more agricultural life. Um, Cain, or Cain, rather, and Abel being associated with um, shepherding and meat production and um, that kind of a life. So I, 
I would want to look more into this, but I do find that interesting, right? Um, so here we have Grendel and monsters who are outcast associated with outdoors, nature, the ocean, the mirror, the forest, all these places. And here it is civilization buildings, the inside, literally a building and all the people inside. Um, so I wanna, I, I'm just curious as to the intent of the poet in choosing, the poet or the scribe in choosing this connection. And so again, that issue of translation comes in, right? Is this, was this section part of the oral tradition? Was this the story that really was passed down? Or was this added in by the scribe when he wrote it down? He or she wrote it down. We don't really know. We can assume, but. Okay, so here we go. After nightfall, here comes Grendel. Um, the people in the hall are starting to drink and um, they're, or sorry, the people in the hall start drinking and having a party. And then, you know, from drinking and eating, they're tired. And so they go to sleep. Grendel comes in and, you know, kills people and goes kind of nuts. Um, and uh, here I say, so what's in, another interesting theme, so, you know, Grendel comes in, kills people, the soldiers can't do anything. And then after that, Grendel continues to attack the hall nightly. The reaction of the people of Herod was uh, to flee and to leave and to start living elsewhere in other little huts. Um, but the poet tells us it's easy to understand them shifting to a safer distance um, because they saw the horrible things happening. So it's understandable. So it's interesting that here within this kingdom, a hero doesn't emerge. The soldiers aren't working and they just all kind of give up and say, oh, we're scared, we're gonna go live in these small huts and just leave the hall alone. And then, so now the person in charge, the king here is Grendel. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wall stead. So that choice of wording, Grendel ruled in defiance. Um, still mimics that um, kingdoms or tribes being overtaken and becoming something else um, and being ruled by a different group of people. Here, his long and un the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud, the idea of feuds, um, nothing but war. So again, this allusion to war, Grendel waging war and feuding. So uh, again, I think this is a parallel in telling the story of what was happening in real life between tribes at the time. A tale that this tale is truly related to kind of teaching people about this, this past of war and, and the ravages of war. Um, so let's see. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties. So the poet keeps telling us that this is ongoing. Uh, now we turn to, um, let's see, for the Prince of Shielding, powerful counselors. Um, I highlighted this part because of uh, the allusion to heathen people. Um, but it is part of getting advice within the text. So again, that inconsistency between when you think about who, who wrote this and what was the intention of the original author versus the scribe. So these were hard times, heartbreaking for the Prince of the Shieldings, powerful counselors, the highest in the land. So in the land at this time, the most powerful people like the, the advice givers, the specialists, the um, experts, um, what they told them to do, the best defense to beat off sudden attacks, um, sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings. So their best defense is giving offerings at pagan shrines, 
They swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save people. So they were looking to pagan gods. And then the poet says that was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge. So here the poet draws that connection between these good people who are in the hall and being ravaged by this hell monster, Grendel. But here there's a connection because they also deep in, in their hearts remember that hell. And that's a relationship to these pagan offerings they're making. This is their solution. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of heavens and high king of the world was unknown to them. So the poet tells us, well, you know, that's just how they did things because they didn't know about a Christian God yet. So again, it, it's just like an interesting thought. Was this original? Uh, is this from the scribe? Um, what was the intent of writing this down, this tale? So here we see we're back at the ocean, boat image. Um, when we start talking about Geatland and we're introduced to Beowulf without knowing who Beowulf is, without hearing his name and knowing that he's gonna come over by boat. Um, nobody tried to keep him from going. They spurred on his ambition. Again, this interesting um, line, instead they inspected omens. So again, they didn't ask God. So, you know, really a lot of times Beowulf is associated with um, being destined by God, but here you see this kind of break. They inspected omens. Um, so that's not, they didn't consult God, which is kind of an interesting uh, difference. So that, it would be kind of cool to write a paper where you look through and look for these inconsistencies and see what's, uh, how Beowulf is associated with pagan gods or, um, and or Christian gods. So then the hero arrives, we get this, here we go, Beowulf, we know his name. So he comes in and Beowulf obviously is very associated with boasting. Um, it is significant to him because even though we see other warriors on Firth, um, who is, you know, questionable warrior according to Beowulf and Wiglaf in the end, who's a very different character, Beowulf is very arrogant and boastful. And, and boasting is part culturally part of this world, right? You're supposed to boast. Um, and, and I think it becomes part of that kind of hero idea, but it'll be interesting to look in the mirror way because she really, uh, Devana Headley really plays with this there. So here he's boasting, I'll take care of it. Not only with I, will I take care of it, I'm not even gonna use weapons. I'm just gonna tear the sky limb from limb. Beowulf's my name, don't forget it. We get this description of Beowulf in his um, weaponry, in his mesh, chain mail. Um, and this is another theme that you see throughout this idea of um, weapons versus not weapons. And it is interesting that Beowulf, this particular hero, seems very obsessed with winning without weapons. And in fact, later on against the dragon, we're told that Beowulf isn't great when it comes to weapons because his hands are so strong that he in and of himself is too strong that he breaks weapons when he tries to use them. And then also when you're looking at the um, previous dead kings and then the ancient people, there are these conversations about weapons and um, and uh, and jewels and treasures. So look at the way weapons, that would be another interesting paper, uh, looking at the way weapons um, are used and talked about throughout the poem. Um, because all, all knew of my awesome strength, they had seen me bolstered in blood of enemies when I battled beasts and da 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 da, -da. I'm amazing, I'm Beowulf. When I, the first time I read Beowulf, I was not, I feel like Beowulf was annoying and he seemed like a terrible person, <laughs> which is interesting because he's supposed to be considered a great, I don't know, I just found him to be questionable. Um, so now I mean to be a match for Grendel, settle the outcome in one single battle. So he's making these huge claims. No weapons, one battle, it's a wrap. 
I'm going to do this. So well, let's see, whichever one doth fells must deem it. So uh, also with Beowulf, you see this happen again and again, that he kind of calls it to fate, that he's going to go into battle, but he accepts that he might die. And if he dies, that's just fate. He, here he says it's judgment by God. Later with the dragon, he talks about it as fate. Um, so again, that inconsistency, or I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just different ways to say the same thing. It might be a translational thing, but something to think about. Um, fate goes ever as fate must. Um, I highlighted that just because that seems to be a theme with Beowulf. So, uh, you know, Beowulf makes his case through his boasting and says, I can do this, hire me, let me do this. And then the king's like, okay, sure, do it. Come on in. So they all come in and they're partying with the Danes. Um, and they're like drinking, pouring bright helpings of mead. They're singing, um, filling Herod with head clearing voices, um, gladdening that great rally of Geats and Danes. So again, throughout the poem, this idea of feud or two different tribes coming together or breaking apart, war versus union, is a theme you see throughout. So here, this is this great rally of Geats and Danes combined. We know later in the retelling that there's a foreshadow that there's going to be a break or a war between the Geats and Danes. From where he crouched at the king's feet, Unferth. So now here comes Unferth. Unferth, that jealous guy who's sitting in the court at the party, and he challenges Beowulf and he starts getting shady. And he starts telling um, about the story of Beowulf where he um, has this battle with his friend Brecca where they're gonna swim out. And, um, and Unferth says like, you did this, but like really it was a vanity thing. You weren't you know, doing anything great. You weren't saving anybody. You guys were just showing off. And in the end, you lost anyway, didn't you? You didn't do anything. Um, he was the better swimmer than you. He outswam you. But you vied for seven nights, then he outswam you. So Becca made good his boast upon you and was proved right. This time you'll be worsted. And then he relates that to this time, you know, you, you're not going to be better than Grendel. Grendel is mighty and crazy and you can't win. So Beowulf, being Beowulf, comes back um, and he's like, first of all, you're drunk, so you're letting the beer do the talking. Second of all, I was the strongest swimmer. He doesn't, however, say he's the strongest swimmer because he beats Brecca. He says he's the strongest swimmer because they swam out. Then they got separated. While they were separated, you know, all these sea monsters came and Beowulf battled them. And not only did he battle them, but he killed every last sea monster, um, saving sailors for centuries to come. Um, so he doesn't really, and so that goes on and on. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't really tell us that he won the swim. He kind of takes into this whole other direction. Um, and then he also burns on Firth and says, now I can't recall, now I cannot recall any fight you entered on Firth that bears comparison. Um, I don't boast when I say that neither you nor Brecca were ever much celebrated for swordsmanship or for facing danger on the field of battle. So he's like, on Firth, you and Brecca are both not even worthy opponents. Have you even fought before? I don't think so. So the king was like, ooh, I love this. I totally am down with Beowulf. I totally believe him. And so we go on to the next section and the fight with Grendel. So uh, Beowulf is in the hall with everybody. Everybody's asleep. Grendel comes sneaking in. Um, and here is where that poet kind of steps out of the story and is giving us that foreshadowing. Here comes Grendel, but one man was in a fighting mood, awakened on edge, spoiling for action. So Beowulf's just hiding in there, ready to fight. 
so they fight um and uh in the end uh grendel gets really scared because uh Beowulf grabs him and he's like, oh shoot, this guy's really strong. Ah, I just want to get out of here. He was desperate to flee to his den and hide with the devil's litter for in all his days he had never been clamped or cornered like this. So Grendel really wanted to retreat here. He was like, I'm out. Like, oh shoot, okay. And so Beowulf could have let him go, chose not to. And he gives him a death blow What's interesting is um, here, the latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip for Grendel the terror monger had taken to Herod. And now the timbers trembled and sang. So now the forest tem trembled and sang a hall session that harrowed every Dane, that scared every Dane. So there's this, this is an interesting detail in the line that I noticed. Um, that I wondered why it was included. So that now the Danes, there's this, so we had been hearing about the singing inside Herod and how that angered Grendel. But now there's this song as Grendel gets wounded and is scared and trying to leave. Um, and there's a song that's sung or that they hear from the trees, from the forest, from the timbers, and it scared every Dane, like it terrified them. Um, interestingly, they, they're fighting inside this hall. So they're inside the hall fighting, which is also um, maybe important also to think about the songs coming from the outside versus the inside. The hall clattered and hammered, um, but somehow uh, the cool hall, the amazingly built hall was still standing. And then we go into the, with the poet where he's talking about um, the sturdiness of the hall. Um, because uh, it says no shielding elder would ever believe that there was any power of person upon earth capable of wrecking their hall. So this hall was built thinking it was like the strongest, best thing ever that nothing could penetrate it, nothing could hurt it. And this fight between this human and this monster, this fight is happening and there are things being broken and the hall, as sturdy as it is, is taking some damage. Okay, so uh, Be uh, Grendel gets hurt and he ends up uh, taking a death wound and kind of going off back home and he dies. It says Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. Grendel was driven under the fen banks, fatally hurt to his desolate lair. So then we go on, the proof of the victory is they followed the trail of blood to Gandalf's camp. So the blood trail was uh, part of how, so not only do you have to kill people, but you have to show proof um, throughout the tale. Um, and culturally at this time, you'll see it happen in Judith as well when you read that. So that was the proof. Now we come to the description of the mirror. So interestingly, you know, you think that's the end of it, but no, now Grendel's mother wants to avenge his death. Um, why is that interesting? Because here, when Beowulf is going to go and find Grendel's mother to kill her because um, Grendel has taken lives, um, he says, Wise sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. But interestingly, Grendel's mother, um, the only reason she came in to kill people was because she's avenging her son's death. So we have our hero talking about that it is better to avenge one's death. So is Grendel's mother really this horrid character? Is the poet intentionally creating this parallel? between again, who are the monsters, who are the people, we're all the same. I don't know, but it is, it, it's an interesting detail. Um, and then it goes into this long fight between the two. Um, she would avenge her only child, a broad wedded knife, da 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 da. Um, and then here's, again, some allusions to, especially towards this section of the text, you start to um, see these allusions to not just weaponry, but the idea that 
It's passed down its ancient weaponry. Then he saw a blade that boded well, a sword in her armony, armory, an ancient heirloom from the days of giants, an ideal weapon, one that any warrior would envy. So the, here's Grendel's mom, who's supposedly a monster, descendant of Cain, these terrible people, and yet she has this ancient heirloom, heirloom an ideal weapon for any warrior. So again, that, that intersection, that conflation between hero and monster, who are these people? Um, so they fight, Beowulf wins, cuts off the mother's head. Um, here, she, here he is using weaponry. Obviously he didn't do hand-to-hand -hand battle, which is also interesting. Um, let's see. Um, so then he also, for some reason, is like, oh, I'm also going to go in and find that dead body of Grendel and cuts off his head. And he takes that back as well. I guess as proof. Um, and then here we get this detail um, from the, sorry guys. <laughs> Here we get this detail. Although Beowulf had at times been poorly regarded, his status as a brave warrior was now set. So again, even though Beowulf is boasting and he's a hero, it does note that at times he had been poor, poorly regarded. And then it was this battle that set that um, confirmed his status as a brave warrior. So it might be interesting also to find the original text where these parts have not been taken out and and go through and maybe even go through this text and see if you can find those descriptions, those moments where Beowulf isn't necessarily the, the hero, has always been regarded as the hero that he is, that we kind of see him to be and that he boasts himself to be. Maybe he's more like that original king who came from um, questionable background and then became a good king which is also then why is the poet including that? What is that theme? What, is, what, what are we here to learn about that? So now we have the dragon section. The dragon section is particularly interesting because it's this, the dragon is inside this um, place where men have never gone. And it is because men go in and disturb it that he, he come fight. This is almost like a reversal of the hall, where now there is this 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 trove, this this area, and the people are outside of it, and then the people enter, and then havoc is wreaked. And it was on the part of the slave; he was fleeing the heavy hand of some master. So, guilt-ridden on the run, going to ground. So, in this story. There is a slave. So it's not, rather than it than the poet choosing to uh, go with the hero, he chooses to go with the slave warrior or soldier or king who is running away from a master. So creating that interesting um, nod to power structures at the time. And he comes in and he steals something, but it's really just to get back in favor with his um, king and to be reinstated to where he was. I've highlighted this in green because this is the section of the text that I find uh, most fascinating, where they talk about the heirlooms. So it starts with the slave, and I, I told you earlier, this means that there's likely missing text, unrecovered text. Um, so panic and ran away. So this is the, the slave panics and runs away with the precious metal work. There were many other heirlooms heaped inside the earth house. So this is referred to as an earth house, which is also um, uh, a significant choice of wording, right? It's not, you know, the den of evil or, you know, the, the demons like dwellings. It's the earth house because long ago, so now we're going into that past with deliberate care. Somebody now forgotten, so a person now forgotten, had buried the riches of a highborn race in this ancient cache. So you see this use of the word highborn race, and you see it again used when they're talking about Beowulf. 
again, this intersection. We're talking about here, we're talking about the dragon and the evil and all this, but we're not, are we? The dragon is protecting the space that at one time, these treasures belonged to these people of a highborn race. Death had come and taken them all in times gone by. And the only one left to tell their tale, the last of their line, could look forward to nothing but the same fate for himself. He foresaw that his joy in the treasure would be brief. So there was one, so everyone gets killed in this ancient group and there's one man left and he even knew that he wouldn't be able to enjoy the treasure. Death would eventually come to him. So death is a theme throughout. Rather than living this great life, it seems like death is a theme and the past and the reoccurring of this um, cycle of life. A newly constructed barrow stood waiting on a wide headland close to the waves, its entryway secured. Into it, the keeper of the hoard had carried all the goods and golden ware worth preserving. His words were few. Now earth, hold what earls once held. So earth, you now hold what the powerful once held. And heroes can't hold it anymore because they're all dead. It was mined from you first by honorable men. And not only that, but these treasures came from you, earth. Men came in and took these pieces of gold and gems and then created these things. And now, you know, what came from you goes back to you. This seems so different than the tale of heroes and the, the main point seems to really change here. What is the poet really wanting us to understand? Why was this originally written? He says, um, my own people have been ruined by war. So again, remember earlier, we've been talking about war throughout, but here the writer tells us people, his people have been ruined by war. One by one, they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or burnish plated goblets. So I'm left with no one. Who am I going to use all this, this gold and treasure with? The companies have departed. The hard helmet hasp with gold will be stripped of its hoops. The helmet shiner who should polish the metal of the war mask sleeps. The coat of mail that came through all those fights whose shield collapsed and cut of sword decays with the warrior. So these mighty weapons, they also decay as the warriors decay. Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. This is a key here. Why is the poet telling us? What is this whole section right before the death of Beowulf? Why do you think this happens here and why does it end here? Why do we have this? Is this the main point, really? Really the way we talk about Beowulf so often is just heroes and this time of like great battles and we love war and all of that. But was that the intention of the writer? I don't know. There seems to be a more interesting tale about the complexity of humanity and war and power and um, the limitation of, of winning and spoils of war and, and weaponry and that in the end, perhaps um, nature uh, and the earth, everything goes back to the earth that came from the earth. So something to think about. <clears throat> so we go on, we have the battle. So I, I'm going to stop here because I think that's enough for you to kind of think about how to look deeper into the lines of the text. Try to be unafraid, focus on the pieces that make sense to you. Um, and again, take some of these, come back and revisit the text as you read The Mirror Wife. When you see clues in The Mirror Wife, come and look here. See what Headley is saying. She is, that entire book is a comment, is a scholarly work, is an essay on Beowulf, if you will. So let's read it from that perspective. All right, I wish we could have this conversation in class, um, but hopefully this is giving you from perspective. I'm gonna stop this video and then um, I'm gonna introduce Judith in another one.